Hello everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to present at the Global Summit on Neurology. My topic is salutogenesis, stress responsivity, and neurobiological mechanisms associated with vertebral subluxation. In this review and commentary, we'll look at where we are, where we need to go, and some ideas on how to get there. Although the Western world is the most technologically advanced civilization to date, it is also the most addicted, obese, medicated, and in-debt adult population in history. This rather scathing indictment of our current position is something that's very difficult to dispute. We'll be looking at some specific numbers momentarily. But the good news is that quality management methods can be used to guide health promotion efforts focused on improving health beyond the absence of disease. Here in the United States, we spend approximately $3.5 trillion per year on health care. I'm tempted to say so-called health care because the focus is not on the creation of health, but on the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of disease. This is a staggering figure. It's 17.9% of our gross domestic product. And to give you some idea of the impact that this has on humanity, 62% of US bankruptcies are attributable in whole or in part to inability to pay healthcare expenses. When we look at these figures, um, they're somewhat mind boggling. So here are some simple calculations that we did to try and make this real for you. If you were to just start counting one number per second, it would take you 11 days to count to a million. It would take you 30 years to count to a billion. And we're, we're speaking of trillions of dollars. If you live that long and did nothing but count 24 seven, it would take you about 300 centuries just to count to one trillion. So what are we getting for it? Medical errors and iatrogenic events are a leading cause of death in the United States. And despite being number one in healthcare expenditures, the U.S. ranks 37th in overall healthcare performance, according to the World Health Organization. In 2016, the BMJ looked at causes of death in the United States, and the leading cause, number one, was heart disease, number two, cancer, and in this paper, they suggested, based on their estimate, that medical error was the third most common cause of death in the United States. The reason it's difficult to quantify this is because there's no computer code for it. There's no ICD code for medical error, yet these are their best available uh, estimates, and it doesn't even include iatrogenic events. In other words, physician-induced illness where the doctor did the right thing, but the patient suffered an adverse consequence due to the inherent risks of the procedure. So they said they're not even counting medical error recorded on US death certificates. Back in 2009, Kilo and Larson in JAMA said this, on balance, the data remain imprecise and the benefits that US healthcare currently delivers may not outweigh the aggregate health harm it imparts. In other words, they're acknowledging that they don't even know if we're breaking even. We know that medicine saves lives, and we know that various procedures and pharmacologic agents cause disease and death, and they're not even sure whether we're breaking even. But here's the optimistic element. They note that healthcare contributes only about 10% toward reducing premature death, and that even a perfectly designed delivery system would prevent only a modest proportion of premature death. In other words, even if we had a perfect medical delivery system, 
there would only be about a potential 10% reduction in premature death, meaning that the other 90% are things that we can control. So where do we stand today? In the world of COVID-19, we see a great deal of fear. People fear for their health, both physical and mental. They're concerned about their personal economic status, their job, their income, what's going to happen to the economy. And of course, there's a fear of social interaction or lack thereof, the consequences of isolation associated with lockdowns and quarantines. And there's a great deal of uncertainty that fuels this fear. If we look at the numbers, they're very scary. Um, from Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, August 14th, 2020, they noted that during late June, 40% of U.S. adults reported struggling with mental health or substance abuse. 31% reported anxiety or depressive symptoms. 26% trauma or stress-related disorders. 13% started or increased substance abuse and an overwhelming 11% seriously considered suicide. In a paper from China, they noted that the prevalence of depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, and a combination of depressive and anxiety symptoms was 43.7%, 37.4%, and 31.3% respectively. These are in adolescents that should be enjoying life. They should be exploring their values. They should be engaged in social activities. They should be thinking about their future in an optimistic context. These numbers are frightening. In a quote attributed to Albert Einstein, it was stated, the significant problems we face today cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. We need a new vision, a new level of thinking, and an individual who provided us with a doorway to a new level of thinking was Aaron Antonovsky. Antonovsky wrote, we are coming to understand health not as the absence of disease, but rather as the process by which individuals maintain their sense of coherence. So what do we mean by sense of coherence? We mean a sense that life is comprehensible, manageable and meaningful, and ability to function in the face of changes in themselves and their relationships with their environments is what we're going for. We want individuals to live their potential as human beings. And the term he coined to describe the map to get there was salutogenesis. It comes from salus, meaning health, invincibility, well-being, happiness, and of course, genesis or origin. It might be loosely translated, giving birth to health. The World Health Organization defines it as the process of enabling individuals and communities to increase control over and to improve their health. Think about it for a moment. Salus. What do people say when they make a toast? Salut. What do soldiers do as a matter of military courtesy upon meeting one another? They salute. Why? Because they're wishing each other health. In 1948, the World Health Organization promulgated a definition of health that I really like. They said health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Even though the WHO adopted this definition in 1948, it still has yet to see any significant integration into the modern healthcare system. So if we compare the concept of salutogenesis with the dominant paradigm of pathogenesis, or looking at causes of disease, we see that pathogenesis starts by considering disease and infirmity and works retrospectively, that is backward, to determine how individuals can avoid, manage, and or eliminate 
that disease or infirmity. In contrast, salutogenesis is the study of health origins and causes. It starts by considering health and looks forward or prospectively at how to create, enhance, and improve physical, mental, and social well-being. Two very different concepts that can and must coexist, but the pathogenic model has become so dominant that the salutogenic model is unknown to most practitioners as well as members of the public. So if we compare the two, the goal in the pathologic model is the prevention and early detection of disease. And that's a worthy goal. Um, unfortunately, the strategy tends to be passive and based upon fear. You know, why should you get a mammogram? Why should you monitor your blood pressure? Why should you monitor your PSA levels and things of this nature? Why? Because if you don't, something bad might happen to you, the ultimate bad event being death. It's usually delivered as an event or series of events or episodes based on normal values and epidemiologic data, where laboratory imaging and case history information is used to come up with a diagnosis and determine how this given disease should be treated or how it might be prevented. In contrast, the salutogenic perspective is one of maximizing the expression of innate potential. It involves an active empowerment strategy where the practitioner is a partner or coach in a lifetime process of realizing the goals that are set by each individual. So, what are three common factors in people who enjoy health? Control. The person's belief that they are able to influence the course of events. This is very significant. Um, many people who seek chiropractic care do so because of chronic back pain and disability. And when you review the literature, it becomes apparent that efforts to relate chronic pain and disability to pathologic lesions seen on imaging studies or otherwise uh, has not been terribly successful. But what has been noted is that individuals with chronic disabilities associated with musculoskeletal disorders report a feeling that they're not in control of their life, particularly in the workplace. Second, we have commitment, embracing a curiosity and sense of meaningfulness for life. And third, challenge the individual's expectation that it is normal and beneficial for life to change. In other words, you're not a victim. You can control and influence your life. Life is a meaningful thing. And best of all, it's normal and beneficial for life to change. That's growth indeed. That's the essence of life itself. So how can we assess salutogenesis? Are there ways of doing so? Well, there are a number of paper and pencil tests that are, of course, inexpensive and easy to administer. They vary somewhat in their uh, length and depth, uh, ranging from uh, as few as seven questions to far more. We have the sense of coherence scale. We have the general self-efficacy scale, the salutogenic wellness promotion scale, the flourishing scale, and PROMISE, which is an acronym for Patient Reported Outcomes Measurement Information System. And by utilizing these paper and pencil tests, we can see if the application of salutogenic strategies has impacted the patient's perception of their health in a favorable way. We can also look at physiologic measurements, uh, beginning with those that involve autonomic nervous system assessment because of its association with stress responsivity. This includes simple low-tech procedures such as heart rate and blood pressure. Uh, next step up in sophistication would be heart rate variability, where we can look at time domain and frequency domain parameters to estimate overall adaptability and to look at potential balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of the autonomic system. And even more exciting are 
uh, works that are being done involving the use of chaotic or nonlinear indicators, uh, indicators of entropy, things of this nature, uh, as they relate to heart rate variability. Uh, skin conductance is also a classic indicator of autonomic arousal. Two that I added to the classic list are strength and flexibility because unlike these instantaneous or near instantaneous physiologic markers, strength and flexibility look at an individual's functional capacity uh, over time and can be very useful, again, in assessing uh, the effectiveness of a salutogenic strategy. We also have laboratory procedures that can be used uh, in a clinical as well as a research setting. Uh, we have cortisol. It's pretty simple to measure salivary cortisol uh, to look at stress responsivity. Uh, we have high sensitivity C-reactive protein, which is associated with inflammation. And it's been suggested that inflammation is a common denominator in many, if not most, pathologic processes. Hemoglobin A1C to look at metabolic syndrome, immunoglobulin A, uh, histamine, uh, again, an inflammatory indicator. And we can also look at neurotransmitters. And this is a relatively easy thing to do. It can be done uh, using urine specimens. Uh, we, of course, have serotonin associated with happiness and well-being, and also digestion, which may go to the gut microbiome. Uh, we have GABA, which, of course, is the major inhibitory neurotransmitter. Dopamine, which regulates pleasure reward pathways and is also associated with motor control and memory. Uh, we have glutamate, a major excitatory neurotransmitter, and of course, uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine. So what's the key to a salutogenic life? Adaptability is really the essence of the salutogenic lifestyle. A thing that makes you different from the chair that you're sitting in is the fact that you have the ability to adapt to environmental dynamics, whereas the chair does not. I know that sounds a little absurd, but think about it for a moment. Adaptability depends on the interaction of adaptation mechanisms at diverse functional levels. This interaction enables the integration of genetic, epigenetic, and environmental factors for coordinated regulation of adaptations. Biologic pathways to adaptability, according to Wolf and Linden in Genes, Brain, and Behavior, are interactions between the genome, our genetic legacy, the epigenome, the expression of our genes, uh, which is something we have quite a bit of control over, our nervous system, which is the coordinator and processors of every dimension of the human experience. And of course, all these things, how we interact with the environment. Dee Dee Palmer, who founded the chiropractic profession, raised a very important query. He wrote, I desired to know why one person was ailing and his associate eating at the same table, working at the same shop, at the same bench was not. How could we have a situation where two individuals living in the same home, working at the same job, at the same bench, breathing the same air, eating the same food, would find themselves in a situation where one would enjoy health and the other would succumb to disease? He concluded quite correctly that it was factors in the individual that were responsible, not the external world. An interesting concept that has been brought forth recently is that of pre-nosology. Nosos, as you know, means disease. And in this paper in Human Physiology, the authors wrote, depending on the functional reserves of the body, vital force, different people exposed to the same stress develop different tensions of the regulatory systems. Prenosological conditions are borderline states between health and disease. Health should be regarded as an equilibrium between the body and the environment. 
To ensure such an equilibrium, the regulatory systems of the body should work intensely. The degree of tension of the regulatory systems required to adapt the body to the environment may be regarded as a measure of health. If we turn back the clock to a publication of D.D. Palmer's from 1910, he wrote, life is the expression of tone. Tone is the normal degree of nerve tension. Tone is expressed in functions by the normal elasticity, activity, strength, and excitability of the various organs as observed in a state of health. Consequently, the cause of disease is any variation of tone. So this concept of tone and tension is shared by contemporary authors in physiology journals and D.D. Palmer, who founded chiropractic in 1895. Hans Selye, as you know, is the individual who adapted the engineering concept of stress to biological systems. And I was privileged to spend some time with Dr. Selye many decades ago when he gave a presentation at Palmer College of Chiropractic. And after he met with the faculty and he told us uh, an amazing story about how he got started on this path. Uh, Selye was a student at the time, a medical student, and was taking a class in differential diagnosis. And this was a pit class where the students were seated in an amphitheater and on the stage would be the professor who would bring patients up, uh, go over their case history, their physical exam findings, uh, their laboratory and imaging findings, their symptomatic presentation and so forth, and would then call upon students in the audience to make a differential diagnosis. Their task was to look at the subtle differences between one disease and another. And Selye was, as he put it, watching this parade of sick people pass by and he said, I got to thinking, you know, instead of looking at the subtle differences between one condition and another, perhaps there's value in looking at what they all have in common. And at this point, as professors are sometimes want to do, the professor called on Selye and said, Selye, what's wrong with this patient? And Selye said, I responded more or less reflexly, uh, why, doctor, he's sick. And of course, everyone had a chuckle at Selye's expense because they thought he wasn't paying attention, but it really got him started on a very exciting path. Selye defines stress as the nonspecific response of the body to any demand. In other words, something that calls upon the body to make an adaptative response. And Selye noted, that every living being has a certain innate or inborn amount of adaptation energy or vitality. Isn't it interesting that we see this term vitality in a number of contemporary writings? We often hear individuals talk about how they wish they had a stress-free life or that they could minimize stress or that they could more effectively manage stress in their life. And as I've told people, if you want a stress-free life, uh, it's going to be a while because until you assume room temperature, uh, you're going to keep on responding to stress. That's the difference between living and non-living matter. And Selye said it so well in noting that complete absence of stress is incompatible with life since only a dead man makes no demand upon his body or mind. Selye wrote the secret of health and happiness lies in successful adjustment to the ever-changing conditions on this globe and that the penalties for failure in this great process of adaptation are disease and unhappiness. Something very important has been lost to most people in contemporary discussions of stress. Most people perceive stress and when they're discussing stress do so in a pejorative context. Uh, with the presumption that stress is something negative, it's something destructive, it's something that we have to fight, that it will hurt us. But Salye said, wait a minute, two types of stress. There's eustress, 
good stress, true stress, positive stress, and that's the essence of the human experience. Uh, that's why people go to movies that they know will make them cry. That's why they jump out of perfectly good airplanes with a parachute for the rush. That's why they eat foods that burn on the way out as well as the way in. They want to experience and grow. Distress, on the other hand, is the negative stuff. And the physiology that the body assumes when faced with an opportunity for growth versus a potential threat is completely different. And fortunately, human beings have the ability to transmute distress into eustress by using the rational mind. And to do that, you need a nervous system that's working without interference. R.W. Stevenson, in the chiropractic textbook published in 1927, discussed one factor that can have a devastating effect on one's adaptive capacity, and that is vertebral subluxation. Stevenson wrote, a subluxation is the condition of a vertebra that has lost its proper juxtaposition with the one above or the one below or both to an extent less than a luxation which impinges nerves and interferes with the transmission of mental impulses. Today, chiropractic care is the analysis and correction of vertebral subluxation for the fullest quality and expression of life, a salutogenic idea. If we look at this cone beam CT scan, uh, you can see at the red arrow on the right side of the screen uh, how the transverse process of the first cervical vertebra or atlas has rotated. You can look at the relationship between the odontoid process and the medial aspect of each lateral mass of atlas, and it's quite obvious that the atlas has rotated. If we look at a cadaveric specimen showing us uh, that environment at the craniocervical junction, uh, that area where skull meets spine, uh, we can see at the upper arrows the vertebral arteries and the hairpin turn. We know that the vertebral arteries pass through the transverse processes of the various cervical vertebra. But I'd like you to note the difference in the arrangement of those arteries here. Uh, we can also see at the yellow arrows, the nerve roots that emerge. So when we have a misalignment of the atlas at the craniocervical junction, we can compromise uh, vascular flow as well as disrupting cerebrospinal fluid flow and causing impingement or stretch on neural tissue. So when we're dealing with stress responsivity, it's important that we not limit our perspective to the traditional HPA axis activation. There's so much more to it than that. We need to first and foremost differentiate eustress from distress and the mechanisms associated with how a body determines whether they're confronting a threat or facing a challenge. One technology that does an excellent job of giving us insight into the adaptive capability of the body and the autonomic nervous system's response to environmental dynamics is heart rate variability. Vertebral subluxations, as we mentioned, are changes in the position or motion of a vertebra which interfere with nerve function. And this phenomenon of vertebral subluxation may result in altered autonomic nervous system activity. Heart rate variability is a reliable and valid tool that may be used to assess the changes in autonomic activity associated with the reduction and correction of vertebral subluxations, and favorable changes in heart rate variability may follow reduction or correction of vertebral subluxations. Uh, not only do we have research studies uh, showing this to be so in some populations, uh, we can do it on individual patients. 
Uh, we don't have to ask, is this generalizable? We can say, what's happening to this patient right now? We should also consider polyvagal theory. Uh, polyvagal theory was proposed by Porges. Most of you, I think, are familiar with it. And Porges posits that physiological states limit the range of behavior and psychological experience. When people talk about stress, they, they often talk about uh, psychological stress. They talk about uh, activation of the fight flight response and so forth. But Porges has taken it beyond that saying that there is a behavioral dynamic here that actually affects interactions between human beings. So polyvagal theory is related to self-regulation, resilience, and adaptability. If we look at this illustration uh, adapted from uh, Deb Dana's diagram on polyvagal theory and the autonomic ladder. At the bottom, we have freeze, dorsal vagal. I can't cope, I'm collapsed, I'm shut down. Then we have fight flight, sympathetic. I'm in danger, I need to run or fight back. And then we have the exciting part, the ventral vagal, which says, I feel connected to the greater world. And that's what we're going for with salutogenic strategies. Another important neurobiologic mechanism is disafferentation. Back in the 1960s, a group of chiropractors came up with a concept that I found very elegant and, and interesting, and that was the neural image. And the neural image is the body's perception of itself in relation to the internal and external environment based upon the integrity of the afferent input, the input from the periphery uh, to the brain. So with disafferentation, it's the perception of the internal and external environment that becomes a key factor in determining whether the nervous system can make a qualitatively and quantitatively appropriate response to a change in the internal or external environment. Uh, as computer mavens are sometimes want to say, garbage in, garbage out. So if the message from the periphery is distorted on the afferent leg of the cycle, we can have problems. We're also concerned about autonomic tone. And early in this discussion, we talked about D.D. Uh, Palmer's concept of tone and the concept of tension or tone as espoused by some more modern physiologists. And the autonomic nervous system, by regulating the actions of the organs, glands, and blood vessels, plays a key role in the adaptive process and vertebral subluxation causes disturbance of function in the autonomic nervous system. Again, this is something we can assess in actual patients in a practical clinical setting. How does chiropractic fit into this concept of salutogenesis? Chiropractic care works on a salutogenic approach, which states that neurological processes, as well as anatomical structures, are remodeled by sensory input. We know that neuroplastic changes occur not only at the level of rewiring synapses. We know that there are non-synaptic methods of neural transmission uh, that we're just starting to understand. And we also know that there are changes in connectomes uh, as information comes in uh, and it's processed in the brain. And finally, we know that there are actually anatomic changes uh, that can be seen on magnetic resonance imaging studies uh, in response to neurobiologic changes. So I'd like to invite you if you have any questions. Um, our time was very limited today, so I had to just touch on some concepts superficially. But if you'd like more, uh, or if you'd like a copy of this PowerPoint, uh, just shoot me an email, ckent at sherman.edu. Thank you.